Total funding for AIDS Challenge on the Home Front is provided by Tallahassee Community Hospital, a progressive acute care hospital and trauma center serving Florida's capital city. Expect excellence from Tallahassee Community Hospital, a subsidiary of HCA, the health care company. Good evening and welcome to the second part of our series on AIDS as it affects our community. It's nice to have you with us tonight. If you missed last night's program, we covered extensively employee relations and some of the frontline personnel with AIDS, what's happening in our emergency rooms and other issues related and helped to dispel some of the myths associated with AIDS. In the second night, we will try and focus in understanding that there are so many different areas we can't even begin to get to. Hopefully those will be things you'll be stimulated to find out on your own, and it's important that you do so. We'll be talking specifically tonight about education, what's being done, what parents can tell their children, and uh, hopefully take care of a few more myths associated with this killer in our country. We'll begin with Dr. Landis Crockett once again. As we begin to, again, dispel a couple of those myths, I'd like people to know what happens. You know, there's a great deal of mystery about what happens when you come in for an AIDS test. Just very technically and specifically, let us know what happens after you've made the decision to get tested so we can take some of the fluff off of that. You walk through the door and what happens? Well, first of all, there are AIDS tests uh, being performed in a lot of variety of settings. Uh, blood banks and hospitals, private doctor's offices. The um, county health departments of the HRS public health system also offer tests to the general public. And there are essentially two levels of tests that are being offered. First, there's a totally anonymous situation where you can have your test performed and uh, the information will be available only to yourself. And this is available in 19 counties in Florida. Dr. Crockett, before you leave that, now, you are positive that there is a totally anonymous system here. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, we have had, uh, I, I know of no negative feedback to, uh, to the contrary about this system, and it's been in operation for several years. It's required by law. And furthermore, it's conducted on the basis of a number. Uh, the individual gets a number, and uh, the test is performed on this basis. Only the counselor then uh, uh, reports to the individual who must uh, produce the number. You understand why I emphasize the question? Oh, yes, sure. And I'm glad you did. Out there. Well, anyway, to explain the system some more, uh, and I, I must uh, I'll inject right now the fact that testing never takes place just by itself. We don't ever just draw somebody's blood and do a laboratory test. Testing is always in the context, at least in the public health system in Florida, of counseling and testing. We will counsel individuals about what the test means, what the implications of the test are, before they ever even get the test. Now, in the anonymous system, uh, when uh, uh, they get the test results back and the individual is counseled again, uh, regardless of po uh, positive or negative, we will always counsel them again at post-testing. Uh, there's another level of testing that goes on, and that is uh, in every uh, county health department of the HRS public health system. We offer what's known as confidential testing. That is to say, uh, conf medical confidentiality under, under the usual uh, circumstances. Uh, the test can be offered to people uh, who come into the health departments for uh, uh, certain uh, programs that we have, such as family planning, sexually transmitted disease, tuberculosis clinics, and maternity clinics. The reason is that we want to identify individuals who might be infected. Uh, it is offered. Um, and of course, in these particular uh, programs, uh, there are, are some kind of relationship to the, to the risk of AIDS. Uh, so we want to identify those people uh, if uh, uh, we can do so uh, and if they will agree to it. Uh, the, both systems are voluntary and th there's a real public health reason for this. We know that we can get, by offering tests in this way, a majority of people to respond out of interest in their own health. 
uh, who have the condition. Now, there is a very uh, uh, hot uh, uh, discussion in this country at the moment, and has been for some years now, as to whether any kind of mandatory testing ought to be put into place, either for marriage licenses or for the general public. And this is done in some countries, such as Cuba. Well, I, I'm going to get to testing in just a minute. Oh, from, okay. From theory. I'm still after just the test itself. Well, the test itself essentially needle. is the counseling session and the drawing of the blood. A little needle. That's just right. a, a little one. A typical <laughs> blood test. Mm -hmm. That's right. A little needle, okay, yeah, uh, in the uh, uh, elbow of the arm, corner of the corner of the arm here. And that's it. Yeah. Is there a reason why we s are there greater numbers in Hispanics and blacks? Have we broken that down at all? Do we know, uh, Dr. Lewis? You've done some research that shows is something about that. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because. I think what I've been sensing, particularly in the black community, Gary, is that there's a certain amount of apathy going on as it relates to AIDS. But I think what we're finding is that nationwide, about approximately 25 percent of the diagnosed cases are in black Americans. We're seeing over 60 percent of the children that are diagnosed with AIDS are black. I think approximately 52 percent of the women are black. So. It, it's an alarming problem in the black community that I think the black community has not yet come to grips with, and we've got to come to grips with that. Uh, Could I make a yeah. point of clarification? Mm -hmm. And that is earlier you mentioned about an AIDS test. Well, there is no such thing as an AIDS test. Mm -hmm. What we're really testing for is the presence of the virus indirectly. We test for what's known as antibodies, which are proteins the body makes to try to fight the infection. That's what we're testing for. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. So there, there's no one test that diagnoses the condition AIDS. Mm -hmm. And just because you're positive on the test doesn't mean you have AIDS. And <clears throat> I'll put this as delicately as possible, but it's almost a bonus in this day and age to come out with to go in with the test and, and find that it's gonorrhea or, or syphilis or, or herpes. I mean, that's almost, you, you've hit the jackpot there, they're haven't curable. you? They're curable. They're not going away either, though. Mm -mm. And we can't forget that, although we're talking about AIDS tonight, that's a very significant <coughs> problem, particularly here in Leon County, as you've probably been reading. Herpes has almost all been but forgotten in all this, hasn't it? Except today it came back up again. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to continue coming back up as we see different types of uh, viruses coming into our sy uh, system like this. And I think we've got to come to grips with it. Have we basically, Dr. Sims, have we forgotten about uh, uh, the spread of, uh, of those types of diseases? Are they on the increase? Because Public health service people certainly haven't forgotten about other sexually transmitted diseases. That's other than this virus that causes AIDS. It's certainly an STD as well. I think perhaps uh, the connection between other sexually transmitted diseases and AIDS needs to be better established in the minds of the public. And that connection is, e is evolving slowly through much research. It does appear as though uh, other sexually transmitted diseases, particularly syphilis and particularly uh, chancro and a number of other uh, STDs that call gen cause genital lesions actually may facilitate the rapid uh, infection uh, by the virus that causes AIDS, so that this so-called cofactor relationship with other STDs is, is emerging rapidly through a number of research programs. So I think that uh, in the public health service, uh, we haven't forgotten that relationship at all. Uh, I think we do need to do a better job of communicating that to the public. And uh, one, one last bit of housekeeping here. Can somebody please uh, give us the difference between having AIDS, how it relates to ARC, what seropositive means in all this, because there is some confusion in the community about that. Well, it's important to, to remember what AIDS actually stands for. Uh, it, 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 it's the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Now, the, the part of that that I like to emphasize is the fact that it's a syndrome. It's actually a, a, a medical condition that is very precisely defined. Now, the reason it's precisely defined is originally we wanted to know exactly what we were dealing with. We didn't want to include something that wasn't AIDS, so because we wanted to define this as a phenomenon and, a, and as a medical condition. But um, the syndrome itself uh, actually represents a very small proportion, a few percentages of everyone who is infected with the virus that will eventually possibly cause this condition. We know that. Uh, uh, there may be uh, uh, up to 50 times or more as many people infected with the virus 
as actually have this syndrome. Now, the immune system becomes damaged in a gradual sort of way. As we talked about before, it takes sometimes eight years before there's any sign of the damage that this virus does at all. Some people have never developed any signs uh, as long as we have known them to be infected of, of the infection, the destruction of certain key immune cells. But the gradual destruction of the immune cells when it does happen leads to a variety of conditions which is manifested by the lowering of the effectiveness of the immune system. Before you actually get to that syndrome, you can have a sort of a down, stepping down process of, of uh, deterioration in, in, in the physical ability to ward off infections. The, hence, we have a, a, a category of illnesses known as AIDS-related complex, which usually means you've got something wrong, but it's not wrong enough to call it AIDS. These, all these people, the people that don't have any infection signs at all, the people that have uh, the, the AIDS-related complex, and the people with AIDS, they all have the virus okay, that can potentially cause this condition. Where are you in all this, David? Uh, David Saunders, for those of you who were not with us last night, is an AIDS patient. Uh, where, what definition do you fall under here? I am an actual diagnosed case of AIDS. I have had one of the opportunistic infections associated with AIDS to be diagnosed that way. What led you to get tested in the first place? <clears throat> I wasn't tested until I came down with pneumocystis pneumonia. Mm -hmm. At that time, they were ruling out that it was any other type of pneumonia. They did the test. I came back positive. Then they confirmed it with a bronchoscopy to determine that it was specifically pneumocystis. What are they telling you now? Where are you in all this? I'm just basically surviving right now. I'm very healthy in between the bouts of pneumonia. I've had three bouts in the last 18 months that I've been diagnosed. Otherwise, I really uh, haven't had any other problems. Medication? I'm on AZT and um, currently have just begun the pentamidine uh, aerosol suppressive therapy to try and prolong the periods between my bouts of pneumonia. You must be aware of the fact that the federal government has not yet made a further commitment to the state of Florida for enormous dollars in, in, for AZT. I'm one of the lucky people that my insurance company has continued paying for everything. What's your thoughts? Uh, I'm very concerned that it might not. So we know each new therapy that I've started, they have had to make a decision about prior to my actually beginning the therapy. They've taken a couple weeks to talk it over among themselves, then decided that they were going to go ahead and pay for it. These therapies would be unavailable to me if I, couldn't, uh, if I didn't have the insurance because they're so expensive. It's about ten to 20,000 a year on the average for AIDS patients, AZT? I think it's come down a little. Somewhere from that, six to eight thousand dollars a year. Six to eight thousand yeah. dollars a year. Six to eight thousand. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, is is he on the state plan or what? What insurance no. covers do you have? No, I'm on uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. Your company pays. For the my yes, um, my company has provided the group plan, so I was already covered prior to prior to being diagnosed. So I had I had been working for Appalachia for a year and a half prior to that. So they haven't had any problem with denying me anything so far. You are really convinced that this is one of the keys to the whole thing, to get those, not necessarily have the insurance companies pay for it, because you, you talked about that last night, but uh, to, to have that wherewithal for people to come forward, do the testing so that their life and liberty is not affected, and that's exactly. really one of the keys. Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, people be encouraged, people who, who feel they might be in a high-risk group, that they be encouraged to uh, engage in voluntary testing. Uh, I've, my experience uh, in talking to the officials at HRS is it's very sensitively handled. Uh, I think Joyner Sims and uh, Landis are good examples of the quality people that are administering our health programs, and I'm very impressed with that. Not to blow smoke, but I believe that. Uh, those who know me well know I would say just the opposite if I felt, felt so felt it, but fortunately I can say, I can say they're doing a, a terrific job. Uh, but I, I think the cost of all this is going to be the, 
the key. I understand you're having a program Tuesday night <clears throat> uh, following this program mm -hmm. that's going to get into the cost. And that's that's the real problem, I think, is how we're going to allocate costs. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, Joyner, you mm -hmm. might have some thoughts on that. Yeah. The original estimations when this first started was, I mean, I heard everything from $1 billion to $2 billion. Now we're hearing $3, 4000000000 billion possibly a year. Oh, the the costs do vary depending upon what you include in the formula for calculating total cost. What we know now in Florida is that the average cost from diagnosis to death of an AIDS patient, we're beginning to get a handle on that, is somewhere between fifty and fifty-five thousand uh, dollars. We're trying uh, uh, almost frantically at times to bring that cost down to make those limited dollars that we have go further and still provide good quality care people with this disease. I think the point that Bill was making is an, is an excellent one. That the one that you're a good it, administrator? Well, <laughs> no, I was skipping over that one and, uh, and, and going back even further to his point about being tested, uh, um, that, that we do need to be concerned about issues of confidentiality. Uh, we're very pleased in the public health sector that we haven't had a single instance of violation of that in our anonymous testing site, our confidential sites. But people do need to feel comfortable about being tested, about determining their health status, to, to um, uh, learn if they are infected, if they are, seek medical care, good rest, nutrition can, we think, delay onset of clinical symptoms, even when AIDS develops, uh, early detection and care can reduce the severe instance and the overall cost to individuals. And so it's terribly important that this issue of confidentiality be discussed and that uh, residents of Florida come to understand that the, uh, there is uh, good protections now, and as this new AIDS law goes into place, there will be even more protections for uh, non-discrimination against people who test positive. So we feel good about that. The confidentiality question is a key one, and I'm, I'm about mm -hmm. to move in, in just a moment here into the whole area of education because I want mm -hmm. to get into some of the preventive ends of this, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of confidentiality, uh, you know, you've got this situation in your emergency rooms where, you know, if you mandatory test, you've sort of stepped over some boundaries there, perhaps. Possibility? Mm -hmm. It's not a mandatory test per se. The physician mm -hmm. orders it. Um, yeah, there's possibilities of that. Uh, if the patient is confidential, uh, those records are not disclosed to the total public. So I don't think there's a, just a wholesale uh, opportunity to look at one's treatment record unless that person gives a consent or unless there's some court order demanding it. Is there is there someone here who's willing to speak to the uh, the issue of testing and then making that information available to a spouse? Yeah, well, that's a good question, and uh, the law is a little uh, unclear on that one. I found it to be as gray as gray gets. <laughs> yeah. The, the, what, what duty does, will the law impose upon a person who knows they have AIDS uh, and yet nevertheless engage in uh, sexual activity with an unsuspecting person? And uh, it seems to me that intuitively that uh, the law will impose a duty of disclosure and open up that person to liability uh, from the victim. That uh, burden falls on the, the health care professional to make that information known? Well, no, I don't mean that. I'm talking a, a hypothetical case. You put it in the context of husband and wife. Uh, but I, I mean in terms of... Uh, of the duty of, say, a person who tests zero positive uh, is therefore a carrier, and but otherwise is in good health. They're mm -hmm. not at the arc of the AIDS, and yet they continue to go out and have sexual relationships with people they meet in bars or uh, boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever the case may be. Uh, joining. I suppose prostitution is one yeah. of the. Uh, well, that's an extreme example. Yeah. I mean, that it is a problem. But let me comment more fundamentally. We have found consistently in our HRS County Health Departments that persons who test positive, positively for this virus, for the antibody to this virus, consistently. Uh, in, in large numbers voluntarily inform their sex or needle sharing partners. We find only a very, very few cases where people find that they're infected, they refuse to tell their sex or needle sharing partners, and they refuse to let public health officials tell them. In fact, in the last 12 months, I would say, uh, through the entire HRS public health system, we've encountered only less than half a dozen of those cases. Each of those, we refer to legal counsel, to our own legal counsel, and do a very uh, thorough but yet uh, a quick uh, legal review and decide whether or not to, to uh, tell the spouse. 
and uh, we do handle those individually. They're very complex situations, but we don't want to lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who are infected with this virus are very cooperative. There are very few that we call non-compliant carriers who, who are infected, who continue to engage in those behaviors that, that, uh, that infect others, and we are concerned, and that includes prostitutes. Uh, I, I'm glad I came back to this because in House Bill 1519, uh, there is a, a clause that indicates mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, states that HIV status of occupant is, uh, uh, no, excuse me, allows uh, physicians to disclose test results of an infected patient to protect an unknowing spouse. <laughs> that's, that's the current legislation that's, uh, uh, we expect uh, the governor to sign into law soon. Uh, and indeed, it says that specifically. Currently in Florida law, there is a provision that would allow public health officials or even private physicians to tell a spouse of a person who's infected, who refuses to tell that spouse themselves, and who refuse to let public health officials or private physician tell that spouse. But that provision is a little less clear mm -hmm. than the comprehensive AIDS legislation that you're referring to now. There is a, uh, an update on that uh, Florida Statute 384 or STD law that will allow physicians, uh, I think, uh, with a little more clarity in law uh, to provide that information without fear of being uh, of, of legal reprimands or legal consequences, rather. Gary, I wonder if there's a policy on the uh, part of the health care uh, people to respond with feedback to the first responders who may end up uh, dealing with someone who um, has AIDS and um, have dealt with them when they were in an injured condition or such and do we get feedback to if is there a response made to law enforcement or the uh, emergency medical technicians there's that is a very uh, uh, unsettled issue as well the whole AIDS discussion involves many such issues that's one where again uh, only time will tell where we uh, conclude or what uh, firm conclusions we reach, and it'll probably take another year or two or more. But let me tell you what we strongly recommend, and I'll do this briefly, that uh, we have great concerns about providing that information from hospitals or health care providers back to emergency uh, medical service people routinely because of the issue of confidentiality. What we do recommend very strongly is that the universal blood precautions be used, and certainly these uh, people are well aware of that, and they do practice universal blood precautions. Secondly, when an exposure occurs uh, of, of the type that Dr. Crockett was talking about, significant contact with blood, uh, then we recommend that uh, emergency service people seek uh, that information voluntarily from the patient or the hospital. And if, it is, if it's given, that's okay. If not, we recommend that they do a baseline blood draw to see if they're infected within you know, two or three days and then follow that with subsequent tests at, uh, at uh, six weeks, three months, six months, and even 12 months to see if infection occurs. Yeah, I'd be in Go ahead, I'm sorry. So to, to sum up then, uh, there is that tug of war between the, the rights of the emergency service, the first responders to know versus confidentiality of the information. But once exposure has occurred, there's nothing you can do to undo that. Consequently, uh, uh, if a patient or if the hospital is, does not voluntarily provide that information, the only other uh, approach is for the first responder to undergo testing. Lieutenant Golden, Leon County Sheriff's Department, and you're right out there at the jail. Go ahead. We, we are in a situation to where whenever an individual uh, comes into the jail, we we don't have a right to to uh, recommend or even test him for anything. Uh, we we uh, are just like everybody else. We try to enhance or try to tell the individual uh, what his uh, chances are of of uh, being isolated and this type of thing of of you know with the disease. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, kind of got our hands tied to the to the fact that we just can't say, hey, just because you're in jail, the uh, you're gonna have to have this this testing done. So we we not only just concerned about just that one just the one disease, AIDS, but we're uh, concerned about 
of the other communicable diseases that uh, that uh, is very prevalent there. And you just can't throw on rubber gloves every time there's a fight in the jail. That's right. We have to. We're the same. We're in the same uh, position that uh, these people here that uh, go out on the wrecks and this type thing. Uh, we just have to handle the situation as it comes up, and that's basically what we do. We just handle it as 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 this. As we see fit. There. Yeah, it was interesting to note that the governor uh, had asked for mandatory testing in the prisons and, and apparently did not get it in this bill. Uh, at least uh, that is the early word on, we still don't know what came out of the Senate, but that's, that's where it is at the moment. Let's talk about education. Because I guess if there's ever a place for prevention, it's in understanding what this is all about. May Waters with the Department of Education is here from the state, and Donna Harper is here from the Leon County School Board. May, I'll begin with you. Are you satisfied that the resources that are necessary are being uh, sent down from state government? And, I, and I'm talking about money here to begin with. Uh, are local school boards and uh, local regions getting the, the resources they need to begin to handle this problem? The only funding that we have within the Department of Education at this point in time is a grant that we've received from CDC, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Uh, that money has helped us set up our Department for AIDS Education and Prevention. We are hoping um, that we will receive extra funding through uh, the legislation. I don't think there's any late word on the appropriations at that point in time. Generally speaking, AIDS education would fall into the existing comprehensive health education legislation. We know for sure that there's less than a dollar per student spent on health education instruction. In fact, it's about 94 cents per child. I'll give you a chance to make history here. You could be the first administrator to answer this question, uh, no. Uh, hey, would you like more money? <laughs> <laughs> We can always... Are you convinced that there is just not a commitment yet to this problem in this state on an education level? I think there is a commitment uh, in wanting to provide the education, but there has not been a commitment for the funding at this point in time unless there is language in, in money in the Appropriations Act, which we don't know at this moment as we speak. Um, I work with uh, district supervisors of health education in 67 districts. Many of our districts have already started implementing AIDS education program. In fact, about a third of our districts have already started doing that. And they're doing it with existing dollars, and they need additional help. We need to provide instructional material for our youngsters in the K-12 program. This new legislation that we've been talking about earlier provides an opportunity for mandated required education and life management skills, which is a course for ninth and 10th grade students. Other language says that we will be implementing AIDS education and prevention in other health science courses. In order to do that, we need to provide in-service training for our teachers, for our school administrators. And we are hoping to be able to do that in the summer months, but we do need some additional funding for that. And you've got some curriculum problems as well where you're going to have to get much more explicit and much more specific in order to begin to create an understanding about these particular subjects, uh, an issue that has never flown very well in this state. True. We're dealing with a local option. It, right now, each district has the privilege of selecting the curriculum of choice. And uh, there are many commercial curriculums with AIDS education available. Some nationally, some are locally developed. But the final decision for implementation rests with each individual district. And here we are. <laughs> Donna Harper from the Leon County School Board. It is, it's a very tough question right now. I read a Gallup poll that said that 42% of parents questioned said that they were willing to turn it over and expect the school system to handle uh, the education in this regard. Uh, it seems like an enormous burden to place on the school system to begin with, uh, not the least of which is, a, a, I'm, I'm sure, a problem of uh, teachers getting a grasp on it themselves. Uh, what are we doing at this level? Well, in all fairness to the parents, for them to, to do otherwise at the current time, there really are no, not very many other resources for them to turn to. There is just beginning to be enough information out there for them to educate themselves, much less to then turn that education into something that the students can understand. But you are isolating that strictly to AIDS now. 
Yes. I mean, it, it, it's probably no surprise to you that generally sex education is something that parents have not confronted their children with in greater percentages. This is true. This is true, and it's true for the Leon County school system so far as the AIDS uh, epidemic is concerned as well, because if we had not just recently implemented sex education in our curriculum, we would be much farther behind in developing curriculum for dealing with AIDS at the current time. It's, um, it, it has really been a great help to us. It's a matter of now taking it one step further rather than starting from the beginning. I've got a 10-year-old daughter. This is the universal question. What should I begin to tell that 10-year-old daughter? How should I begin to confront this? If she's 10, then she's just beginning to enter the age where she needs to have much more specific information on the AIDS virus itself, on, the, on HIV. Um, up until that time, she probably has just needed to have a great deal of information on regular safety and hygiene habits, uh, many of which are, are going to be changing now that we're learning more um, about the HIV itself. But um, as she gets older, she's going to need to know how the virus itself enters the body, uh, what changes it makes within the body, how it travels from one person to another. She's going to need much more specific information. And unless she's unusual, she's probably already started asking questions, either of you or of others. Not about AIDS necessarily, but about her own body. I would imagine about both. I have an 11-year-old daughter who's already begun asking me questions about AIDS and started a year ago. But I would suggest you're probably one of those parents that spends a little time with that anyway. I think a lot of parents are that way. In, is it an unfair position to put parents in today, May, to, to expect them to relate this significance of this information since we're just kind of getting it ourselves? I think parents have to become involved. And I think the uh, mail out that you talked about earlier in regards to uh, brochure mailed from the Surgeon General to every home, that's a good starting piece. There's an abundance of material there. I think parents have to take the responsibility be to become involved. I think schools will be certainly uh, implementing more programs, but it's a cooperative venture with the parents and the school. Donna Harper, your problems go far beyond just educating that child. We have got many children who are AIDS patients. They will be going into our school systems and already are. In fact, we've had some well-publicized cases where they have found significant problems in the area of peer relationships, uh, is literally staying in school. Um, in Leon County, how have you all sort of addressed that and, and what's your thinking on it? Our policy is that a student who is not posing a threat to him or herself or to others has a right to education within their regular school setting that is dictated by their educational needs and that they also have a right to privacy so far as their medical needs and their medical conditions are concerned. Um, and we start from that point once they've entered the school system. If at any time their condition changes and upon uh, our discovering that that child does carry the AIDS virus and their condition changes, then they will have regular uh, reviews mm -hmm. at uh, different points. And their educational program will be adjusted according to uh, how much danger they are posing for themselves or the other students in the classroom. And um, an educational setting that's appropriate for them at that time will then be provided. But this is an area of almost ever-changing policy, isn't it? I mean, you're just sort of... It, it's a live out. policy that will have to constantly be adjusted to new information if it's going to be a good policy. We will not see a, a child denied educational opportunities in Leon County. Not as far as I know and not with our current policy. Can we discuss the same question on a statewide basis? Are you comfortable with that? The commissioner released guidelines back last October 15th of 87, uh, whereby she recommends that uh, all students are entitled to a public education. And uh, if there are reasons for uh, any disease of any kind, communicable disease, each case would be investigated case by case. Dr. Lewis has to have been confronted on the university level. 
So the universities have been grappling with the problem, and we are have in fact uh, adopted guidelines for treating both students as well as students who may be victims within the uh, university system. And by and large, our policy is that uh, students will be provided an education in the state university system. Are you comfortable with the level of education taking place at, in the university system with AIDS? I think it could be greater always. I think what we're trying to do uh, within the nine state university systems right now is to get as much information in the hands of the students as well as our health, uh, student health departments to disseminate to our student populations. And I think that effort is going along quite significantly well. Susan. Let's get back to the AIDS hotline for a minute because we are talking about education here and what all that means and how people are finding out. How extensive is the training of the volunteers? What, what do they have to find out in, in order to be able to deal with what must be an unlimited number of questions that they're asked? Well, first of all, they don't need any previous experience with AIDS or counseling or anything like that. We do provide them with all the counseling and support they need on the phones. Um, we do answer any type of AIDS question that they have. We give referrals, and we also do short-term counseling on the line. We don't just stop with information. So we teach them basic counseling skills, we teach, teach them all the facts about AIDS, and we teach them how to deal with specific calls like suicide or hysteria or things like that. These are just regular folks on these phone lines? Mm-hmm. People from the community, uh, students, retired persons, professionals, homemakers, all types of people. It's not to assume that all of you aren't regular folks. Mm -hmm. Trying to break it down, so. David? I was just going to say, I went through the training recently. It's, uh, the regular training is about 10 weeks long, and uh, there's a lot of intensive weekends where there's a lot of sharing of feelings about the AIDS topic to begin with because a lot of people when they're going through the training find that they have problems that dealing with the issue that they didn't realize they had before it becomes a lot more personal a lot more closer to home and uh, right now because of the expanded phone lines um, the individuals that are going through training right now <coughs> have had a shortened version of only about 10 to 10 days to two weeks I think and I think they're just doing informational and passing off to people who have had training in the counseling. But um, it was a real uh, rewarding experience for me to go through with it because there was a, a lot of sharing and uh, being in my situation. It's a lot of educational things too, dealing with other people's feelings, things that I hadn't had to go with, uh, go through yet, I've dealt with on the phones. Mm. Norman Easterbrook is with Tallahassee AIDS Support Services. Nice to have you here. Thanks. Are you satisfied with the level of communication that's taking place in the community now? To some extent, yes. Uh, we fight, I think, uh, more a, an, uh, an ingrown denial and apathy that this really is a crisis that's touching every single individual in this community. Uh, examples of that are, are surveys that aren't responded to. Uh, sent around the medical community. Uh, we work with patients that are in desperate need of, of care, uh, some of them indigent, and it's, it's hard to find uh, people willing to provide that care. It, from the medical community? From the medical community, yes. Uh, you must have more thoughts about that. I mean, is it a, uh, is it a system problem? Is it a personality problem? Is I it think in part it's a system problem. I think we've spoken a lot about about the fears that people have about the virus. Uh, part of what we try to do is educate people so that they can have the facts uh, and you know can be able to work with with the patients and so on. Let me ask Pam to step up here for just a second. Pam Culvertstone is the uh, employee health nurse at uh, Tallahassee Community Hospital. Nice to have you here Hello. tonight. Uh, how are you, are you comfortable with the education of the people involved in all this? Uh, nurses, custodians, everybody up and down the line? It's an ongoing uh, course. Uh, all new employees that come into our facility, and I think probably any facility in Tallahassee, are taught the basic infection control policies that the hospital has, what our policy is regarding blood and body fluid precautions. And we also discussed the new OSHA standards regarding protection and, uh, uh, of, of hepatitis and of AIDS. Uh, I think we try to instill in our employees that there's a lot of infectious diseases we need to be worried about. AIDS is, of course, the major topic nowadays, but that we need to think before we do a lot of things. 
uh, that we used to just do for granted, take, take for granted, just do. Um, I think that it's just ongoing. Uh, uh, I probably spend a lot of my time sitting reading articles and reading new, new news releases and things just like a lot of people do here in this room. And a lot of what I have to do is to take that and transmit it and, and try to pass it on to the employees as soon as I can get it and try to keep them informed of the newest developments. And it's, it's just ongoing all the time. There's new things coming out. And uh, I'll sit in front of a group of employees and say, as of today at 3.30, this is what the new standard is. And it can change the next day. It can change the next hour. And I need to establish my credibility uh, a lot of times in saying that, you know, I'm standing up here as, quote, the expert in the hospital on infectious diseases and AIDS, and the next thing I'll know, a newspaper article comes out and I'm, I'm shot down, you know. So a lot of things that what I have to say, I'm always saying, but, but this may change tomorrow. I think that I think that if we can get education, if we can, and we as employers in the hospital can talk to people and have the general employees in the hospital understand what the disease is, what hepatitis is, what uh, TB is, what venereal disease is, and we can talk to everybody on that point. I think I think we can pretty much calm the panic in the hospital by saying, you know, this is what's going on. I, you need to be more concerned about outside the hospital than you are inside the hospital. I think that's what we need to worry about. Hmm. We've got about uh, about 18 minutes to go here, and that means I'm going to use the opportunity to jump around and hit a, a, a number of issues that uh, perhaps we haven't been able to spend an enormous amount of time on, uh, but you know, uh, perhaps we should spend more. Uh, the whole issue of prostitution is one that we just we, we kind of glazed over and we really didn't touch because it it, it represents a, a kind of a greater situation of not being able to uh, uh, to focus our resources I suppose uh, I imagine there's some frustration in in the area of law enforcement and in, in in working hard to keep folks off the street who inevitably find themselves back on the street and and doing what they did before there must be some level there well, I don't uh, disassociate prostitution from uh, drug uh, alcohol abuse. Uh, I find them to be directly related in many cases. Uh, the female addict is very often uh, a prostitute. Uh, we probably didn't make two arrests last year in Leon County for prostitution. We made 700 or 800 arrests for drugs and may have taken some prostitutes off the street in that process. Uh, in terms of, of uh, law enforcement, I think the uh, initial fear of AIDS is probably past. There's a latent anxiety because I don't know of any law enforcement officer in Florida that's uh, come down with AIDS because of their activities in their job. Uh, maybe in their personal life, as someone said earlier, but not in their, in their job. And uh, I don't look for much of a change in terms of the way we do business in the, in the future other than extra equipment we carry along and, and maybe a delay in the administration of uh, assistance to somebody who has stopped breathing while they look for a, a CPR mask or something like that. You know, I'm finding myself guilty of the same prejudice. It's a sexually transmitted disease, so you automatically think of, of the sexual contact when the drug contact, and that may, I'm, I'm, this may be a societal prejudice as well, the drug contact may be even more significant. I think Chief Tucker's made an excellent point, and that is, one, is that uh, prostitution is certainly a problem uh, related to drug use. It's a problem in the spread of AIDS. We don't know how severe that transmission is by prostitutes. But the second point I think he made very well is that uh, if we hypothetically could remove all prostitution, female prostitutes, male prostitutes, uh, that would probably represent only a small portion of the problem we have with it's transmission really of this problem, virus. Is it? No, it isn't. It's a part, just a small part. We don't know how big that part is. I but say you know small, relatively small. That. The public views, here, here's this person who's infected, mm -hmm. and they are uh, with multiple partners, mm -hmm. as is the nature of prostitution, mm -hmm. and then the numbers just start to get cumulative. Yes, indeed, and uh, it's, that's, a, that's a legitimate kind of concern. But again, uh, there's a great deal of behavior that's transmitting this virus from one person to another across this country that doesn't even come close to the definition of prostitution. So if we keep that in perspective, one, it's serious. 
no doubt. And we in public health sector, as well as the law enforcement people, are very concerned about that. But the headline stories dealing with prostitutes who are infected, I think, have created the impression that prostitutes solely are responsible for spreading this virus across our country. They're making their contribution, but there are many, many other major sources of transmission that we need to look at also. Now, let me go back down to Harper. Well, this is um, exactly one of the situations that we run into as we in the Leon County school system are developing curriculum for our students. We're still in that process right now um, of developing that curriculum, and one of the the, the most difficult parts that we have yet to overcome is, is trying to decide exactly how to best approach not just the, the medical aspects of it, we have that pretty much down pat, how it's transmitted and, and teaching those specific things in biology and in health classes. But they're dealing with the social, the moral, and the emotional aspects of it and how that relates to so many other subjects within the school system, for instance, drug education. Because it is so intertwined into all aspects of our lives, it can't be treated solely as a biology or a health subject. And trying to deal with that vast aspect of it, that is why it's such an all-encompassing uh, disease so far as our society is concerned, and that's why each one of us needs to be concerned about it because it is not just, as you pointed out, a matter of sexual contact. It's within the, the drug community and it's going to be um, something that's going to be concerning all of us. Bill? <coughs> no, I, I uh, was about to make you that echo point. Echo that same yeah. point. Nick Carbone. I serve on the Health Council <coughs> and one of the big problems that, that uh, we find is getting into the rural counties for educational purposes. Uh, many of these counties don't even want to call it sex education. You know, there's a problem with teenage pregnancies and uh, prenatal care and those, those types of health-related problems. And getting education material to these people is very difficult. When a county wants to refer to it as, quote, personal, personal hygiene instead of sex education, you begin to see the magnitude of the problem of getting education uh, in, into those areas. Now we're fortunate in this county, I think, that uh, not only because of, of programs like this, but there are many uh, uh, programs that are available. The, the uh, school uh, board talks about it and, and, and the like. But you get in some of these other counties, uh, they haven't got over the stigma of sex education. Now I realize that's maybe we talk about it's not the, the primary cause, but somewhere along the line, uh, that problem is going to filter out into these counties, and you're going to have one devil of a time getting education out there. Uh, are you satisfied with the media's relationship in all this? Uh, because the, the the sexy story is is the prostitute one. You know that that's the one that you, you <coughs> could draw somebody's eye to a newspaper headline. I think Joyner even perhaps almost offhandedly mentioned headlines. <laughs> I, I picked that up. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you might. <laughs> Uh, are you satisfied that they're really going after the meat um, uh, and, uh, and staying away from some of the sensationalism? Respecting the right, I suppose, of a newspaper, uh, in, in your particular case, to, uh, to stimulate circulation, and, and there, there has to be some of the other? Well, Gary, there are two kinds of things uh, for the purpose of this conversation that we do. We write about unusual things that, uh, that people react to, whether it's, uh, we call it sensationalism or just the kind of story that, that uh, you react to. Uh, someone knowingly going around uh, spreading AIDS, uh, a prison situation where a prisoner is trying to get a guard by, uh, you know, and this, uh, or these kinds of things, mm -hmm. those are the stories that you react to as a reader, and yeah, we're, we will those stories are going to make headlines. The other kind of things we do are, are the more normal things we do day in and day out, uh, that uh, the, the monitoring uh, the, the numbers, uh, printing the new, the most recent information on AIDS, finding the compelling uh, uh, story of someone who's dealing with AIDS, personalizing, humanizing uh, a serious uh, problem. So we will, we will certainly be doing both of those kinds of stories over time and have done both those kinds and will continue to do those. Bill? I, I found the medium, media, and by that I mean radio, television, 
and the newspapers have been uh, particularly effective. Um, and there's a lot that the newspapers do that I'm not terribly impressed with. <laughs> That's why I'm so TV shocked as well. You but <laughs> but uh, I will say on this AIDS thing that it's been a remarkable contribution. Uh, uh, McNeil Lara, 2020 57th Street, I saw three of their programs uh, on TV. This program is a good example. Uh, USA Today did a, a, a series of very, very good informational pieces. Uh, the magazines, uh, Newsweek uh, and Time, but both run <clears throat> specials on AIDS. And I think they've done a remarkable job, frankly, in, uh, in giving the political establishment a good kick in the behind. Uh, both at the federal and state level. I would echo that, but I, I would like to, I, I guess this program is kind of like the a Baptist preacher preaching to uh, to a audience of one with a choir in the background of 200. <laughs> to probably reaching some people that uh, we need, need not reach because I think they're not at risk, but we need to do a better job of targeting our media at those high-risk people. Those people who have uh, drug abusers, teaching them how since we can't overnight change their habit, we can change the way they go about that habit. And I think that's what we've got to do and other cities are doing a, I think a fairly fantastic job of that. We've got to also target information and those other individuals who have behavior that put themselves at risk. And I think that uh, if we can do that, our role as, as government officials and health care providers will be better served. Yeah, but you, putting yourself in the role of a county commissioner, which should be easy for you to do, you can't expect the media to fulfill that responsibility. No, and that's where I think we, particularly in Leon County, are, are trying to begin developing programs to do that same kind of thing. The Board of County Commissioners, as you know, have uh, asked the County Health Department to come up with some strategies for how Leon County would deal with it, both from an educational standpoint as well as addressing the issues that we talked about in the jail. We have a, a myriad of legal and ethical issues that are facing our county and local governments all over the country right now, and we, we, we don't have all the answers just yet. The media can't be uh, solely responsible for getting that information out. Uh, I think that most everyone understands that, but they can certainly be a major vehicle for um, bringing it to the attention of the community, for coordinating forums such as this one, for um, having articles of information available to people in the community. As we were developing our policy in the school system, uh, we talk to other school districts around the nation who had been successful in dealing with AIDS when it had reached their community. We also talked with some communities who weren't that successful, trying to find out what the magic keys were and what were the, the most important elements in having a successful program. And in every case, it ended up being a community that understood so that they could cope with the information or cope with the situation when it arose. In other words, the information was out there in time for them to deal with it and deal with it quickly. Uh, the longer it took the community to gain specific information to educate themselves, uh, the greater the reaction was against the presence of AIDS within their community. And it was a much more negative situation when the community itself was not well educated. So having a well educated community who understands uh, the situation, who has the details, who knows how to cope with it, how their community is coping with it, with their hospitals, with their schools, with their cities and counties, with their police and sheriff forces are going to do. Um, that is very, very important to the people. Communities who have that react much more positively and compassionately to the situation and can cope much better. Mm. Yeah, when you talk about education, you have to kind of define that down. Uh, one form of education is, that, is the, uh, the purpose is perhaps to change behavioral patterns. Uh, but uh, uh, very important, too, is the education uh, of decision makers and leadership in the community. And uh, employers are a very important uh, target group in that regard. Are you satisfied with the growth that's taken place in our community? Well, uh, in this community, uh, it's a little unique because you have uh, state government here, you have Proximity. universities and so forth. So I would say as far as this community is concerned, it's been uh, probably somewhat exemplary. Uh, as Mr. Carbone said, I think you, when you get into the 
rural communities and perhaps other places in the state, uh, there's probably a lot of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> I know with respect to employers in the business community, uh, the small businessman is a person who really needs a uh, considerable amount of attention. Uh, I'm talking a workforce of maybe 10 to 12 people. The larger companies, like uh, uh, your company, uh, Homes, you know, and land. Homes and Land, or the Tallahassee uh, Democrat, or the Tallahassee Democrat, usually has the the resources to do in-house training and to send their people to conferences and so forth, like we run at the center. But uh, right now, I got to figure out some kind of way to reach the uh, the uh, uh, medium, the small businessman. And what I'm hoping to do through, when I say wait me, I mean the Center for Employment Relations and Law, where we do a lot of educational programs in this area, is to try to reach the trade associations, you know, like Associated Industries, uh, the Chamber of Commerces uh, at the floor, at the statewide level and then at the local level, and to try to uh, activate the private sector more and uh, the businessman more because I think there's a lot of intelligence, there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of potential there and I think they have a very serious uh, responsibility and not so much they have certainly Nobel's oblige but they also have uh, the, uh, there's a pragmatic factor here that would serve their interest to get into this as, as, as quickly as they can. I'm going to break uh, every rule of television here. Uh, there's two minutes to go in the show, and I'm going to ask uh, Landis Crockett a question. Uh, <laughs> you are in those 14 counties. You're in some of the small counties. You're just not here in Leon County. Is the word getting out like it needs to get out to those places? Understanding that you have about a minute to answer. Well, it's a philosophical question. I don't think it's getting out to my satisfaction, but I do think that uh, it is getting out. There are things happening to get the word out. We're chipping away at the problem. Uh, but there's no question that information is the key because in all of history, mankind has never had the information that we have where we know exactly what causes uh, the, the mm -hmm. epidemic at hand. And it's going to be a real challenge for us to take that information and actually use it to stop the spread of the epidemic. From what we know now, we ought to be able to stop AIDS cold. There ought not to need be a single other case of AIDS or, or HIV infection occur from what we know now if mm -hmm. we were able to universally apply it. And that depends on education. Right now we don't have any other choice. That's our challenge. And that is of uh, endless frustration but commitment to you. Well, we have to do it. Right now we have no other way. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it has been an interesting discussion, one which uh, I think, uh, if nothing else, has uh, created, uh, I hope, the, the moist palates in the community to get them to find out some of the answers uh, for themselves, because there was no way we could answer them all here. But I thank you for your participation, specifically yours as well. Thank all you folks for being here. It was nice having you here tonight. Well, we hope you've got some answers. These two nights were meant to just give you an idea of who some of the people were in our community who were making strides towards age education and the folks in the trenches who are actually there uh, being responsible for what happens here. Now it's up to you to get the information and to do something with it. It is something we can get a handle on, and we wish you the best of luck in doing so. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. for AIDS Challenge on the Home Front is provided by Tallahassee Community Hospital, a progressive acute care hospital and trauma center serving Florida's capital city. Expect excellence from Tallahassee Community Hospital, a subsidiary of HCA, the health care company.